If you have your Bibles with you this morning, I ask you to turn to 2 Peter. 2 Peter, the first chapter, while you're turning there, uh, we uh, updated some of y'all about how things is going in Paris, and then I'm going to let uh, Brother Kimmy tell you more about it at the end of the service and what our thinkings are and what our prayers need to be for the church so um, the Lord will move the right people and uh, pray the Lord would be lifted up in it. Second Peter chapter 1 in the first verse. Second Peter chapter 1, the first verse, the Bible says, Simon Peter, a servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ, to wit, to them that have obtained like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. According as his divine power have given unto us all the things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that have called us to glory and virtue. Whereby are given unto us exceeding great precious promises that by these you might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in this world through lust. And besides this, giving all diligence to add to your faith virtue, and virtue knowledge, and to knowledge temperance, and to temperance patience, and to patience godliness, and to godliness brother, brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness charity. And if these things be in you and abound, they make you that you shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But he that lacketh these things is blind and cannot see afar off, and have forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. Wherefore, the rather, the rather brethren, make diligence to make your calling and election sure. For if you do these things, ye shall never fall. Mm. Dear Lord, we thank you and we praise you for your goodness and watch care. We pray that you would bless us as a people here together in Dover. Lord, that we would be found faithful as a testimony uh, to you in this place. Lord, we pray as we reach out in other directions, God, that you would give us leadership, that you give us guidance. Lord, uh, that you would uh, grant other people faith. Lord, now we pray that you would give us the strength to just to focus in on your word for a short time and that you would honor your word with the presence of the Holy Ghost. And we'd be faithful to give you the praise for it, for it's in Christ's name that we do pray. Amen. Amen. Now, uh, maybe not so familiar scriptures, except the one that I quote very frequently, and that is to make your calling and election sure. But as Peter was writing this second time to a number of churches, he addresses a lot of things before he gets down there to uh, the 10th verse. Now, one of the main things that he addresses is Christian character or holiness. Now, we do not see that in the modern day except maybe in this minuscule of time and then in pop, it's gone. And we do not carry that character with us on a daily basis. We do not present it to other people as we should. Now, he begins with his credentials. He says, Simon Peter, a servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ. Now, there's a great deal of debate out there today, and there ought to be debate among Baptist people. The apostolic office is dead. Mm -hmm. Now, everyone that made that requirement, that you will find in Acts chapter 1, when they were choosing Matthias to take Judas Iscariot's place, I want you to see that everybody that made those qualifications is now dead. Now, the, it is an impossibility for any group, I don't care who they are, to say they're of the, they can say they're of the apostolic faith because that's what we are of, given the truth, can, right. but they are not apostles. Amen. There is, there's a huge difference there, and you'll have even women today rising up and say, oh yeah, I'm an apostle. Well, no, you're not in yeah. any shape, form, or fashion. Right. 
But Paul, Peter had these credentials, and he wanted to know this group of churches that he was writing to wasn't an individual church. It was a numer numerous churches that he had the authority to say this. He had seen it and practiced it and understood it more than anybody else. Now, as we get down to these credentials of a good believer, he didn't start out with many of them. Peter was a loud mouth. Peter was pious. Peter thought he knew more than other people. And again and again and again, you'll find the Lord had to rebuke him and put him back in his place. Simon Peter, a servant and apostle, and an apostle of, the, of Jesus Christ, to them that have obtained like precious faith. Now, this morning, that makes it new and real to us because I don't know about you, but I have the precious faith of that the Lord Jesus Christ is my intercessor and my Savior, and He bids all things well for me. I, just like uh, the Apostle Peter, have like precious faith. Uh, having faith in something will do something to you. Amen. Uh, having faith for your salvation it is a glorious gift of God, but having faith to move on that is quite the other. And I don't see much of that today, do you? I don't see people moving on their faith. Yes, I love Jesus. Well, tell somebody about it. Tell him of his goodness and grace. Have faith. And, and so Paul says, you have this precious faith, even like unto me. And then he begins to make application in their daily life. Now notice how you get it. Well, like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. In other words, this righteousness that he's talking about can't be obtained of self. If you're waiting till you get good enough to do something for God, you'll certainly never do it. You'll still be waiting and waiting on the pew for your righteousness when you're in your 90s, and you'll never do anything that amounts for the service of God because, listen, the righteousness is not in you. It's in the most holy. Yeah. It's in the God of the Bible. And, and so a lot of people use that, and what I found by and large is really just an excuse because they don't want to do nothing. That, 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 that's what it really gets down to. And so, hinging on our faith being in Christ, he says in verse 2, grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God. Now, you know, and I don't see it among this group, but there's a lot of people out there today with this crazy Biden stuff and Trump acting like an idiot and all that stuff. You know what? A lot of people don't have no peace right now. I have great peace because I have a God that fed people when there was nothing Amen. for them to eat. Amen. Very same God, very same. But you know what? You know what the problem is? Well, their, their peace is so poor, their faith is poor. Mm -hmm. They don't know enough about the God in the Bible to know that he's the one that caused good cold water to run out of a rock. That's right. They don't know God well enough that he made food when there was none. That's right. and, and so, yeah, they're tore up because you know what? They're depending on their self. Uh, Brother Kenny and I was talking about this. Wouldn't it be a horrible state this morning to think that you're depending on your ungodly works to be saved? Yeah. Well, what kind of peace is in that? Listen, I know what the junk I'm cut from, yeah. and I don't want to be depending on me yeah. in any sort of yeah. any sort of way whatsoever. And so, Peter wanted them to be peaceful in their walk with God, and he ends it with this in verse two. The only thing that will happen is knowledge of God and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. If you don't know about them, listen, you're not going to have any peace. Everybody says, oh, you know, we, uh, we live literally in the middle of the Bible. Belt. But you know what I found? That, that those credentials don't mean much because most people mean, know very little about the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah. And I would say they know less about the person of the great God Jehovah. Yeah. And the reason why we've almost, you know, uh, New Testament believers, just the, the, the first three-fourths of the book, they just leave out. Yeah, come on. 
And, and you know what? That's our, the Bible said, Paul said, that's our schoolmaster. Yes. That, that, that's the one that teaches us. He Amen. wasn't talking about the New Testament. It didn't even exist then. Yeah. And, and, and so we see then that if we're going to have the peace that God wants us to, it's got to start with knowing Christ and knowing God. And where you'll get that is on this book that's in front of you. Verse 3, as according as his divine power have given us all things that pertain unto life. Now, I want you to see he's given us all things that pertain unto life. Now, it's not all things that you want. It's not, it's not the nicest house in Stewart County. What are the things that pertain to life? Something to eat and something to drink. That's all you need. Anything above that is a great, wonderful blessing. Really, that is a great, wonderful blessing. And if you've gone without food, and you know none of us can say that. We didn't have a lot of food when I was growing up, but we had something to eat. You see what I'm saying? Uh, I can't claim that I went hungry. I, I can't claim that I, you know, and, and you know, usually it was hand-me-downs, but I always had something to wear. I didn't go cold like that. They weren't maybe as stylish as everybody else, but I had something to wear. He, he, he gives us that that pertains to life. Yeah, amen. So uh, don't get stressed out if they come off and uh, cut. And, you know, that's all such a great, you know, our perspective, too, is a whole lot of that. Uh, I had a chuckle when Brother King was driving to Paris, and he was complaining about his light bill. I said, man, I don't know. It just, just tore me up, too. He said, uh, ours was $125. And I just laughed. That's like you don't know. You don't even want to know what ours was. And but it's perspective, is it not? And so we, as the Lord's people, He's going to provide what we need. And and I'll have the money for my light bill, but grace be to God. And He'll have the money for His light bill, grace be to God, yeah. because He is a very good provider. But you know what? Our light bills are different, so He's going to give me what I need. He's going to give Him what He needs as time as time provides. Yeah. And so when we look at this, all you know, what pertains to life is very minuscule, really. Uh, what you want is out like this. And, and so we find that he, he makes us that prom promise of all that pertaining to life and godliness. So we have the equipment to live because of God's goodness. And we have the equipment to be godly because of God's goodness. Amen. Don't tell me you can't do it. Right. Because God said you can't. Amen. Now, it never ceases to amaze me. Amaze me, God's people await patiently on the loaf of bread and give no thought whatsoever of their presentation to other people. What they say, how they say it, what they wear, what they don't wear. <laughs> right? You have the ability to live a godly life or he would not expect it of you. No. And, and so we find then, uh, he says, I'm going to give you the ability for two things, for the goodness of life and for a godly life. On top of that, you have it. Then he gives, uh, then he gives us to begin to look at ourselves very carefully. And, and this is what you can measure your godliness by. These are the things that need to be present for a godly life. So he says... Through the knowledge of him that called us to glory and virtue. So the way that you know that what appertains to godliness is through knowledge. Listen, you're never going to understand godliness until you get in this book yourself. Amen. You know what? Um, my, my, uh, I have close friends and families that are Pentecostal. And what I found, most of them have not studied this book. What I found, as long as they have long hair and skirts on, they're going to glory. Dear friend, I, I hate to tell you, it doesn't work that way. But I've also found this, a lot of them. Now, over in West Tennessee, when me and Don lived in Wheaton County, you couldn't throw a rock without hitting the holiest person. And, I mean, they were everywhere. 
And there is this chain of groceries over there, I don't know if it exists anymore, called E.W. James and Sons. And the E.W. was right around the corner from me and Donna's apartment. And every person in that store was Pentecostal. And I'm not making that up. It's a wonder it just didn't explode on you. And, and those some of the hatefulest men, they be checking you out and throwing you stuff. And I mean, just rude. Does that pertain to the godliness? I would think not. And they had their buns and skirts on and still just as mean as snakes. That, that, that doesn't pertain to Christ, does it? I, I don't think so. And, and so he's getting really to get in some very uh, difficult spiritual characteristics that, that we really have to answer for ourselves because nobody else can answer for us. Verse 5. And besides this, giving all diligence to add to your faith, your believing faith, your trusting faith, not the faith, meaning the oracles delivered to the saints, but having, uh, add, besides just giving all diligence to add to your, your faith, virtue, and to virtue knowledge. Now, there's not a one of us here that doesn't have virtue of some kind, because that's literally a characteristic. That's what that word means. Uh, I used to have black hair, now it's black and gray. Uh, of all my children, Sarah looks the more like me than any of them, sad to say, bless her heart, right? Uh, we both have olive skin, we both have dark brown eyes, we both have dark hair, and that's, that's characteristics, that's virtue. What are your characteristics this morning? How do you present it? What do you look like to other people? What, what does other people hear running out of your mouth? What, what are your virtues? Now, he said that if we trust him and we do have faith in him like we should, virtue, characteristics, things would come that speak of the name of Christ. And to knowledge, temperance. Now back in... Uh, the 1920s, there was a huge temperance movement, mostly headed by women that wanted a better husband. Well, if you want a better husband, be careful who you marry, right? And, uh, and, and, and the attempt was to end alcohol abuse by the government in the United States. Listen, the government's not ever gonna end sin. What I found with governments, we think they make the situation worse. And, and, and so there was no way to defeat that. And the temperance movement, as it was called back then, didn't work. Right. And the reason temperance, that's a gun to characteristics. And you can't give that to people by legislation. Amen. Temperance is control of yourself. I've heard people say, well, I just can't help it. Well, if you say, I believe by the word of God, yeah, you can. Right. Right? Temperance is something we should strive for. We should get in the word of God. And when we have that impulse, whatever it is, Bible teaches us there's a besetting sin. And, you know, I don't know what your besetting sin is. Uh, and you don't know what mine is. You know, I, I, sometimes I think I have a, a wagon full of them. But what we need is temperance. Get on that thing and control it. And because but the Bible says here that we can. Now, I want you to see the subsequency of these things. I believe they grow as you grow. And temperance, according to this, is very early on. Uh, it, it is a primary thing that we should see in the life of a believer. Then he says, and to temperance, patience. Now, I know I don't have enough of this one, and I really have been struggling with that literally the most of my adult life, and uh, just not be patient enough. The Lord set me in the, in the passenger seat for five years to teach me patience. Mm -hmm. And it's difficult when you can't get up and go when you want to. Imagine, man, can't you go get you a cold drink unless you ask somebody to take it. Pretty humbling for a man, is it not? But it taught me patience, at least for a while. 
Now, Brother Kenny and I, we're ready to set Curtis on fire. But he's trying his patience. Yeah. You wait. Listen, I'll say this. You, you and uh, Kenny and Jerry, listen. If you do something like that, it'll blow up in your face. Uh, a solid rock is something God lays. And give, just take time. Just take time. So patience, then, is something that he anticipates us to have. And I believe the reason why is because, too, well, number one, we've already discussed that the work of the Lord is slow and tedious, and it takes a lot of effort. And then, on the flip side, listen, uh, uh, I, I've heard since the very first I could remember all the churches I've ever visited, every place I've ever been as a boy this high, Jesus is coming soon. Right? 40, because I remember back to my story, I remember my grandpa had a stroke and I remember a great grandmother just before she died. So I, I can remember back to 72, 71, 72. And even then they were telling me Jesus is on his way. Sure. 50 years ago. You know what? It's still as true today as it was then. But certainly we can't sit on our backsides waiting for Jesus to come and do nothing. Yeah, amen. Because you know what? It may be well that Bella will someday say, well, Daddy said his whole ministry that Jesus was coming. And I may be pushing daisies up next door. And you know what? The truth of that statement hasn't changed, but right. what did I do in the years in between? Right. You're right, brother. When when we're done, we're done. Yeah. And if you don't if you don't serve him while you have the strength and ability, listen, you won't serve him as you get over, uh, because the infirmities of the flesh will take it from you. So I want you to see that it just takes patience. And then he said to patience, godliness. Now, God in us is God-like. Uh, it's the character of God. And, and you know, this is the thing about God. We think about His omnipotence and, and how, how, how far off, except for the person of Christ, that He really is. And how can I do that? Well, you can bear, the rep you can bear love. Mm. You know what I've found among sovereign grace? people since I came to those truths, they're some of the most snooty people you'll find. Got their five points, pack them in the Bible and go to the house. You know, I don't think that speaks of God, do you? I really don't. I don't, I don't think that speaks of the Lord Jesus Christ. He walked 60 miles, that's from here to Dixon, to get scripture, scriptural baptism. Yeah. That, that's not somebody that just took it easy, is it? And so we as the Lord's people, we need to convey godliness. And you're not going to do that by running other people down. You're not going to do that by making fun of people that's more ignorant of the scriptures than you are. And listen, ain't none of us arrived yet. In fact, I know if you studied that Bible till you died and got the concepts of the whole, the Bible says this of its own self, the half has never yet been. So at the best, you'll know how, right? <laughs> and so we find then that we as the Lord's people, we just need to be a compassionate, caring people with the character of God displayed in our life. Verse 8, for these things be in you, for if these things be in you and abound, which means to, to mushroom, to, to strengthen, to go out, Deeper and deeper, if they if they are a fruitful crop in you. But if these things be in you abound, they make you that you should neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, what does it mean to be barren? And it used to be an embarrassment to a woman, but now it's almost a good thing. <laughs> Barren means you can't produce a child. <clears throat> and he said, if you don't have these things, you're going to be barren spiritually. Now, think back to the first child you had. Me and Donna were barely 21 when Adam was born, and 
We didn't know a lot about babies, and, but man, we thought he was something else. <laughs> and uh, we we would take him around and show him to people. And we lived in Dresden at the time. And believe it or not, we both had bicycles back then. And we would put Adam on the back and take off and ride around with him. He he was just the apple of our eye. And then here comes Matthew. And then we got in the bikes to go on my bike. And um, took the boys around. People don't have love like that for their children anymore, do they? I mean, look around. The time they're six weeks old, they got them carted off to daycare. Right? People, people don't, they're, even when they have children, they're buried. My, my. Mm -hmm. You know, truthfully, they, they, they don't take interest in it. I remember me and Donna was in nursing school, and I thought she was having a mental health breakdown. I had a bunch of psychology classes along with me, and I thought, well, Donna slipped out. And, uh, but we took, the first day here we found was a woman who took her children privately in her home. And she couldn't hand Adam over, and she was crying, and I was like, Donna, we're going to be late for school. And she just couldn't hardly do it. That's someone that loves their child. No. And you don't see that anymore. By and large, people look at child, as children as a hardship. But now, with the pride that we had in all of our children, and you look back now, if we had none, if we never had the wonderness of holding that little baby in your hand and say, you know what? The joy and the incredible responsibility of saying, this is mine. <laughs> this is mine to care for. This is mine to take responsibility of. This is mine to love. And then never ever enjoying that, ever. Now that's being barren. That, that's having no fruit. That's having no issue. Then how could we possibly be satisfied with a barren Christian life where there's no issue, there's no fruit, there's nothing within us that speaks the name of Jesus? And, and you know what? Uh, I see a lot of barren Christians today. Listen, they'll show up for services and they may be glad to be there and they may not be glad. They may, they may uh, rejoice in the things of the Lord and they may sit there and tap their watch. You know what the Bible says? They're barren. They don't have any of these fruits that we just discussed. They're barren. They're fruitless. They're not, they're not producing. And uh, that's a different sermon for a different time, but you know what happened to the fruit tree that was barren? He gave it three years and it was gone. And, and, and so we find them, we ought to take care of that were not buried. Verse 9. But he that lacketh these things, all these spiritual fruits, but he that lacketh these things is blind and cannot see afar off. Now, this is, this is the thing about being blind. Not only can you not watch out for the safety of others, you can't even watch out for the safety of yourself. Now, when I do this, I, I, I don't even know where my children are at. I, I'm pretty much legally blind without my glasses. And how could I help somebody else if I can't help myself? And he said, if you don't have these characteristics, you're blind. Yeah. If you don't have, you know, it's hard to warn somebody when you can't see it yourself. Y'all yeah, remember, my brother Kenny won't remember this rest of you will. When we were doing that mission, we were doing a mission conference one time, and one of the exercises of going to an uh, unknown part of Stuart County and getting yourself back. Well, if y'all remember, Brother Ashley Hornsby was our team leader. And we got lost back on these Leatherwood Woods. Uh, and thank God Millie knew them better than we did. But as we were walking along, and Justin walked forward walking like this, and I thought, well, he's being sure that he's not stepping on a snake or something. Stepped right on a snake that big, and God was with him. Stepped on that snake. 
right on the head and the snake died. And I don't know what kind it was, but I think it was cockroach. But you, I said, Justin Lackey, what are you doing? Oh, I didn't see it. <laughs> and, but he killed it. You see what I'm saying? Uh, the reason he didn't see it is he wasn't watching. He wasn't watching. And you know how you're going to step on the snake is because you're not watching. You know how we're going to be in trouble because you're not watching. You have to watch yourself. And, and so we find here that uh, as the Lord's people that we need to be at the top of this. We don't need to be the one that lacks these fruits. We need to be the ones that dwell in these fruits, that are abundant in these fruits. But he that lacketh these things is blind and cannot see afar off and have forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. Now, you know, sometimes you get down to the Avril Jr. We're talking about this a little bit. You don't, uh, this morning a little bit, you don't feel like you can go on. Well, you think back to the time that you were saved and the Lord rolled that heavy burden away and you were out of the confines of sin. You were no longer condemned. You were no longer on your way to hell. And you know what? That'll make you happy in the things of the Lord. You know how, if I understand this verse, how you get in the condition is forgetting what he done. You know why there's no more missionaries than we have? It's because people are forgetting what Christ done for them. You know, everybody said, well, you got to get the leadership of the Lord. I understand what they're saying. But see, if you remember the love of Christ that he had for you, you will do most anything for him. Yep. And when you forget it, you don't. Mm -hmm. When you forget it, you don't. And so we find then as the Lord's people uh, that we need to be very acutely aware and when you get in this condition remember what he did for you verse 10 wherefore the rather brethren give diligence to make your calling and election sure and that's colon that means that first statement would stand by itself i'm pretty sure i'm right uh, 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 I have to get my English checked out by Jared when this is over with. But I believe if I remember, Miss Claude told me if there was a colon, a full colon there, that both those sentences would stand alone. And he says, you give diligence to make a calling and election sure. Now, my understanding, election is an act of God an act of the Almighty before eternity began. And to me, it would be very difficult to make that sure. There has to be a way or we wouldn't have been bidden to do so. But I can't get it. But you know what I can get? I can be certain about the calling. Has Jesus drawn you to himself? Or is it something you've worked up in the flesh? See, I want to be no, I want to know that I've been called and drawn by the Almighty. Right. I, I want to be certain. Listen, uh, I, I don't want to build my faith on Baptist doctrine. I want to build my faith on the person of Amen. Jesus Christ. And I want to know more than I want to know the sun's coming up in the morning. I want to know that I am in Christ. Yes. Do you know it? And you know, it, it, it's not a bad thing. Everybody said, well, uh, well, you're doubting God. Now you're doubting yourself, which is right. just, <laughs> right? It, it's a good, you can't trust this flesh as far as it here from the back door, back door. And so you know what? I'll make my calling and election sure and be sure I understand and know the person of Christ and I stand within him. And you know what? I believe I know him so well. When I get to glory, nobody's going to have to say, that's him. I'm going to know him and I'm going to drop at his feet and I'm going to yeah, praise yeah. him throughout the season's ages. That is that is what I want to do. Dear friend, I don't care how long you've been saved, how long you think you've known the Lord, you make your calling and you make your election sure this morning because tomorrow morning may not come. Amen. And so we see as the Lord's people that we need to take Peter's advice and every once in a while compare our fruits to what we say we have, to what we claim does your fruits line it up? Verse 11. Uh, excuse me, the rest of verse 10. For if you do these things, 
you shall never fall. Now, in addition, a lot of people would say that you can fall from your salvation. They use that verse in that way. But you know what? If you're not compassionate, if you're not hungry for the Word of God, if you're not diligent in your faith, if you're not, uh, if you're not given to study, you're going to fall. It's just like, if we don't know something's there and somebody don't point it out to us, if you get us into great trouble. It's not falling from salvation. It's falling from your testimony. And listen, dear friend, if your testimony is falling, you'll never get it back. We need to be, uh, be very, very careful that we don't fall. But you know what? I've fallen. And you have to, if you'll be, if you'll be omitted with me, you'll be honest with me. You know, best thing you can do is do this, dust her off, and keep going. Amen. Because see, the Satan would like you to be right here and waddle around for the rest of your life. Yeah. But that's not what he bids us to do. Right. And, and, and so we find then, as the Lord's people, what we need to do is know that we're saved. And when we know we're saved, be certain these fruits are there. And if the fruits are there, continue on in grace, whatever he bids you to do, Amen. whatever he calls you to do. If it's here, South America or Russia, you get there and you stay there where God would bid you to be. Yeah. That is the hallmark of Christian. Uh, verse 11. For, for so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord Jesus, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Wherefore I will not be negligent to put you always in remembrance of these things, though, though you should know them and be established in the present truth. Now I want you to see, he said, I'm never going to quit preaching on this. I'm never going to get, you know, Lord be my helper and, and you know, I, I know people think I harp on it all the time, but Lord be my helper, I'll never quit preaching on separation because see, when you get out in that world, you're going to be influenced by that world, you're going to be taken over by that world, you're going to look like the world, act like the world, be like the world, and you know what? If you are saved, you'll be cold as a cucumber. Yeah, that, that, that's it. And Lord being my helper, I will never ever quit preaching divine grace. Because I've known way too many people that were deceived. Yeah. Thought they had something that they did. And sometimes I don't, sometimes maybe well-meaning people, I don't know. Sometimes I wonder if, if, if they're deceivers deliberately. You know, somebody will tell you that baptism is necessary. You know what they are? They're a deceiver. Yep. That's it. And we as God's people, we get a little, we get a little uh, uh, upset to say things like that. Well, if, if they believe that to virtue, what else can you say? They believe in baptismal regeneration, right? Mm -hmm. Have a friend, and she she is a member at a Methodist church, and she and I used to work together, and we'd get into a lot of talks, and she came from a Southern Baptist background. And, and we would talk. And she was trying to pin that they had a woman preacher. <laughs> the Methodists are getting more and more. And uh, they had a woman preacher, and she was talking to this woman, and this Baptist, the story, you know, she'd been a Baptist before, was trying to pin her down. They said, well, what do y'all believe about salvation? And they him hung around, and she said, don't him hung around. She, <laughs> she's a very direct person, I'll put it that way. And she said, don't you him hung around, what do you believe? And uh, she, he, she goes, you believe in baptismal regeneration. That old Methodist woman picked up a little bit. Yes. Uh, well, the only thing I can say is at least she's honest. Right? You know what? They need to be rebuked in their wrong. And not, not to be mad, not to be, oh, I know everything. But you know what? They're believing a lie. Mm -hmm. You know what the Bible says uh, concerning that? You can be a, believe a lie and be damned. Amen. That's it. That's a scary thought. Mm -hmm. Now, and, and I didn't see it either. I was talking about Justin. I didn't see it either. But what kind of friend would I have been to Justin if I saw a snake 
and didn't say Justin there to snake. Right. Now thank God the Lord took care of all that and his sovereignty. But that wouldn't have been much of a friend, would it? No. And you know what? If he got bitten, at least part of the blame would have been on me. Right? Yeah. So we need to take the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ extremely seriously. We don't need to compromise it. Again, we don't want to go around and that's why I believe Peter put the fruits of the Spirit first. We don't need to go around like, oh, I'm sovereign grace. Catch me if you can. All right? But we do need to say, with a spirit of love. Listen, you know what I found when witnessing people of other faiths? You read this right here, and you, you take it home with you, and just review it yourself, and I'll pray for you. A lot, a lot better than beating them down with the Bible, isn't it? Yeah. That's it. Yeah. Because what I found when people pray still so threatened, they're going to they're gonna, they're gonna ask for it. So this morning, do you have it or do you don't? Have you made your calling and election sure today? Have you, do you know that you stand in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ? And we're not baptized in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. We're, we're saved in Him. He, he calls into Himself. He rids us of religion like He did for Nicodemus. And He leaves it completely in grace. Are you saved? Have you ever felt Him drawing you to Himself? But we'll see, that's how it, it happens. Yeah. He, he, draw, he makes the gospel enlightening and beautiful to you for the first time. Yeah. Amen. And he gives you new life. You know what? If you don't have something to compare to that, take, take Peter's advice and make it call an election sure. Be sure that you stand in Christ because tomorrow may not come. And maybe not just because the Lord's sweet return. Maybe that we wake up to communist government tomorrow. Yeah. Not, not, not outside the realm of possibility. Uh, you ever thought about that? And I thought a little bit about it. And they were talking about the redistribution of wealth, and I'm not sure I understand all that, what that means. But there's me and Donna and three kids. They might say, you know what, that house is way too big for you. You don't need a four-bedroom house. You're going to an apartment. And if you think that's crazy, ask the Russians. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. And that may happen. And if that happened, you know what? They may plop me down with kids in an apartment in Nashville, Tennessee. Never get to see you guys again. Yeah. That... But you know, God suffice. And while we're here, and while we're together, and we have this opportunity, dwell on the gospel this morning. Mm -hmm. Think about it. Be sure that you have something that you can take to the grave peaceably with. Yeah. Because nothing else is going to matter. Yeah.